Uh, members, are we aware of any apologies? Uh, Jim Wells may well be late. He's on ABG. Yeah. Uh, I saw him there. He said he was be in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. And in that case, I have no notice that any members have delegated authorities and other committee into the vote. No. Noted. Uh, de declaration of interest. All members are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest as the committee meeting is applicable. Any declarations of interest? Uh, chairperson's business number three, sort of ministerial statement. Uh, the minister has provided a number of written and oral statements since the committee last met. A written statement on the Fiscal Council and Fiscal Commission is at page seven of your papers. If the committee is content, I will meet informally with the chairperson of the Fiscal Commission on the 30th of March. Are we content? It is understood that the fisc both the Fiscal Commission and the Fiscal Council will be seeking views from stakeholders, including political parties, shortly. It is anticipated that following this process, the Fiscal Council and probably the Fiscal Commission will seek to brief the Committee of Finance. Uh, Paul, you met with the Minister regarding his oral statement on business support measures. Would you like to say anything, or are you content? No, I think uh, we covered at the meeting what he had said then at the in the Assembly Chamber, so I don't think there's anything that I can add to it that would uh, inform members further. Okay. And um, may I say, remiss of me, actually, um, Chair and members, or sort of a clerk and members of the committee, to thank the Deputy Chair for stepping in for me. Uh, so my, uh, as my ability to bounce off concrete structures <laughs> is not particularly good. Uh, but thank you very much indeed. Okay. Are we all content to note? Great. Okay. Moving on to the Budget Scrutiny 21-22. The committee agreed when it last met to write to the minister setting out its concerns and those of the other statutory committees in respect to the 21-22 budget. It is understood that the executive will clarify the position in respect of the overall 21-22 budget and associated allocations to departments shortly. Hopefully this will address some of the statutory committee's concerns which have been set out in a response during the budget debates. The committee will in May consider the anticipated budget number two, Bill 2021 and will be again asked its opinion in respect of accelerated passage. It is therefore proposed that I write to the chairpersons of all the other statutory committees, ask them to take evidence on the final 21-22 budget position, including the carryovers and allocations from the Chancellor's statement and other more recent Barnet allocations. And you will be aware of the uh, Health Minister of the Department, uh, Matt Hancock's uh, commentary about the extra 220 million that he expected to come to Northern Ireland and the fact that he anticipated that was going to go to health, so that you're aware of that, uh, from the departments in April and a response to the Committee for Finance in early May. These responses would, after consideration by the Finance Committee, be published along with this Committee's views on the 21-22 budget and would serve to inform members' contribution during the budget debate in June. Are we content with this approach? Great. Members are also content to publish a letter to the Minister sent following our last meeting setting out the Committee's views on the 21-22 budget on our web page. Are we agreed? Agreed. When the Department specifies the date for monitoring rounds, it suggests that the Committee writes again to statutory committees and suggests that they schedule pre-monitoring round bid, oral briefings and post-monitoring round allocations, written briefings. It suggested that we uh, delay consideration of monitoring rounds for now and until the Department specifies the key dates, which I don't think we've had an indication of yet, have we? No. Okay. Are we content to delay this matter for now? Agreed. Uh, minutes of proceedings. Uh, uh, minutes of proceedings of the 10th of March are page 25. Any comments? Paul, are you content to sign off on those today? Yep. yep. Great. Matters are rising. There are no matters arising. Uh, if we can bring into spotlight, can we bring on Starley for the Northern Ireland Procurement Board update? Uh, can we bring in Michael and Paul, please? Maybe Des Armstrong. Oh, it's Des. Des, can we bring in Des and Paul? Okay, team. The clerk's cover note is at page 34. Update from the Department of the Northern Ireland Procurement Board. It's page 42. Department correspondence and the Northern Ireland Procurement Board meeting notes from the 16th of December at page 50. The latest Cabinet Office update on Common Framework is page three of the tabled items, and departmental correspondence of the Public Procurement Common Framework is at page 25 of the tabled items. A copy of the Provision Common Framework is page 32 of the tabled items. 
is it Des, are you going to lead off? Or is it Paul? I think you're muted, Des. Des, can you come up? Des, you're muted. You're muted. How's that? That's better, Des. Apologies, committee. Over to you, Des. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and the committee. A bit of feedback here. So, um, Michael was coming along this afternoon, but has unfortunately been called away. Um, and hopefully, uh, bring yourself a ball and be able to answer any questions that you have in relation to the particular board and any other matters that are relevant at Germany. Um, I'm getting quite a bit of feedback on my end here. I'm not sure if you can pick that up. Yes, can you turn the sign down a bit? Just save that. You give us a test count, Des, to see if that's working. Um, one, two. <laughs> that's Test. better. That's better. Testing. Testing. Nice, Des. Right. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, I'll struggle on. I'm still getting a bit of feedback here, but um, yeah, I suppose very quickly then, just to recap. Finance Minister has announced uh, reconstituted procurement board in the Assembly back on the 1st of December. I think that announcement had quite widespread uh, support. Uh, and sort of the driver end behind this is to make sure that procurement policies going forward uh, fully reflect the executive's priorities uh, and their intentions for the spend of public, uh, public money. Um, the, the new board brings together, we believe, expertise both inside government and across and then to a number of important sectors in the Northern Ireland economy. Uh, and the purpose then is that the Minister will receive hopefully the best and widest advice that uh, was settling on a particular policy initiative which you would like to bring to the Executive for endorsement. I think this is an important uh, development that the executive is seen to be uh, in, in charge of the procurement function rather than sometimes, I suppose, we'll maybe touch on this a bit, but it's seen as CPD's policy and therefore, um, you know, sometimes the, uh, the full implementation of policies is a bit less maybe in some places than what it should be. Uh, I'm still getting a bit of feedback on that, so sir, if you, if you wish, I'm happy to, to move to questions. Yeah, I think, I think are we content to move on to questions? Okay. We couldn't get our technical people to deal with the feedback, could we? Trying to. Um, they're, they're coming back to me. Okay. okay. So, Des, while we're waiting to get the sort of the feedback issue sorted out between the two of you, I've got a couple of questions I probably want to ask you as well. Um, uh, the Cabinet Office Green Paper and it says it's transforming public procurement it suggests there's going to be a lot of changes in public procurement in England and that the UK Government will be engaged with the devolved administrations in this regard. Can you give us a view Sorry. on how the... Sorry, sir, I'm, I'm, I'm I that question. You're not hearing us? It's, 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 it's bringing up pretty badly. Um, they even come back and switch off any take them off and yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Des, Paul, can you come off and come back on again and see if that yeah, improves we'll, it? We'll, we'll do that now. Chaps, do you also want to turn off Jabber as well, if you've got it, and any headphones you've got? Sorry, Chair. Yeah. What's Jabber? Jabber is uh, their clever version, much cleverer version of Starleaf. So you can do like video calls. When I was in agriculture, we could we could be video called at our desks at any moment. But it, it is very clever. But Except it doesn't work. Well, I, th I think it interferes <laughs> with Starleaf. Is my understanding. All oh, right. It's something I've been told. So. Okay. Where are we back? Des, we back up? Yet. <laughs> I can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, that's true. Paul, can you hear us? Yes, true, sorry. You still got that feedback? Chaps, you want to try turning down your um, laptop volume? Else. It's not our end. Okay, we're being told it's your end. 
So if you can turn down the laptop volume. Hopefully that's better. That's fine for you, Paul. Yes. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I said you could live with that, yeah. Okay. Okay. Back to the question then. Um, the Cabinet Office Green Paper Transforming Public Procurement suggests a lot of changes in public procurement in England, and the Government will engage with the devolved administrations in this regard. Can you advise, uh, has the Cabinet Office engaged with you on particular in respect of this? And the other issue is, does um, CPD require public contracting authority bodies to use still use the official journal of the European Union to advertise tenders, or is the UK's new Find a Tender service now in use, as that has also been indicated in the Green Paper? Well, I think, I mean, Paul, maybe you can answer just on the on the engagement piece, if that's okay. Yeah, that's no problem. Um, I've been involved in both. Actually, um, in relation to the engagement, uh, as we previously uh, responded to the committee, the uh, the actual consultation itself was uh, listed from the cabinet office, and it was at a developed stage when they contacted us, and they gave us the opportunity to discuss each of the options with the paper with them and to represent the local view. We have done that, and we know that the fact the recent meeting with them this morning, that consultation is now closed. There have been 600 responses, and an official cabinet office response will be published in gov.uk um, towards the end of May. This response, then, we will get further scrutiny of the, the, the proposals, and they will then proceed to take that forward with the respective ministers. But, but at each stage and any stage, we will be fully um, informed and fully up to speed with what that contains and what that would be proposing. And as you say, the, the regulations, whilst that was a consultation based in England, the regulations do apply to England, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland have their own regulations. So any any further amendments to those our regulations would be subject to executive and ministerial approval and there would be nothing done on our behalf without our consent. Our consent. Mm -hmm. To quickly address the OG as well, since the 31st of December at 11 o'clock, our only tender system, which is used by the public sector in Northern Ireland, has been uh, revised to allow contracting authorities to use the finance tender service, as you're quite correct, it's, they're obliged to use that uh, given the regulations now rather than the OG. However, there will be still those cases where some EU monies or funded projects will be advertised and be required to advertise in e-tenders, so the system itself retains the opportunity to advertise in the FTS only, OG and FTS or OG only, depending on the need at that time for each contract authority. So how can we so how can we advertise in the official journal of the European Union if we're not in the European Union? Because the, we may have certain uh, funded pro EU funded projects that are still in existence that could require us to meet that requirement, but we would also advertise in the find a tender service as well. There'd be dual advertisement. Okay. Okay. Um, where are we with the public procurement common framework? It says, it says the executive has signed off on a provisional version. When will this, uh, when will this be revised? Uh, will this be revised, and will it be subject to further feedback from us? Yeah, um, we have just again this week we were informed that it, the public procurement common framework met with GMC approval on the fourth of March. Now we were informed by the coming of us last week and now the cabinet office yesterday have published the details of the public procurement framework and another three on gov.uk for the purpose of letting respective committees see that and scrutinize it and or feedback as they see fit we will then in the, the coming days we will be forwarding uh, the official approved version of the framework to you for further scrutiny okay and you what but before the easter break do you think yes Thanks. Matthew? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, one issue that came up whenever we um, engaged with the Construction Employers Federation was a concern around under threshold procurement. And as I understood it, their concern was, though I'm 
going through the, our pack from that week and also trying to recollect my own brain, but their pack was on NI um, uh, companies, obviously in their case construction firms, but I presume it more widely than that, being uh, losing out to in relation to southern procurement because the protocol is not explicit that um, uh, that they basically you know, would continue to have access, if I'm understanding that correctly. Is that being addressed? Or are, are you doing well, that? Is that first of it being addressed? Start on that, I suppose, it, to be clear, above threshold procurements are covered uh, because there will be a link back into the EU directives on public procurement by virtue of the fact that we become a member of the World Trade Organization and the, you know, the procurement agreement that's in place there. Low threshold, there's also always been a bit of a, a discussion as to how far the European regulations will go uh, with the low threshold procurement. Our previous position when we were part of the, the EU, family, if I can put it that way, was that we had to take into account uh, a broader consideration because of a potential cross-border uh, interest in whatever the under, under threshold procurement might be. So, you know, going forward, probably that exists, but that's something that is not fully defined. Um, so there is potentially a situation that could arise where um, you know a move is made that below threshold procurements, um, you know, would maybe not be as open as up as the requirements above threshold. Um, but we've agreed with the construction industry. Uh, Federation or the Employers Construction Employers Federation and through the Construction Industry Forum just to monitor the situation and if you know that becomes an issue then we would have to raise that I suppose it's a trade issue first of all uh, and you know that's that's the way we'd have to proceed. Paul do you want to sort of give some backup on that? Yeah um, nothing really more to add than that but I, I do re realise that the, the concern, especially the CEF that raised with members previously, was about um, a, a PPA that was published locally as well in, on the mainland that reserved contracts for specific counties in England. Yeah. And again, given that concern, we have uh, contacted Cabinet Office and got a commitment from them that they will review the impact of this policy and uh, keep us informed. So we, we have raised that. And as Dennis says, the, the blue threshold opportunities sort of reverts a wee bit more back to the competence of the jurisdiction that decides and how to, to process those. However, we have raised that with Cabinet Office and again, the issues with uh, ROI would be the fact that whilst we would expect um, fair treatment and non-discrimination and the cross-border interest, especially with uh, our, our local market and how, how sort of compact it is across the island, then yes, we would expect that treatment, but it, it would be fall upon a matter of trade. But there's basically, we have an issue with blue threshold. It relates to both the Republic, but also certain public bodies in England, because they no, EU legislation no longer applies, meaning uh, uh, meaning that below threshold, basically, they have more flexibility in terms of whether they, could, they can just procure locally, or they can, in a sense, they have more potential flexibility to discriminate in a way they didn't before. And that could be Louth County Council, could be Louth County Council, that, you know, 50 miles south of here, or if there is a Louth, Louth District Council in Lincolnshire. Yeah, I think I think that's 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 the issue for low low threshold uh, procurement, and you know, obviously the concern is that quite a lot of our procurements uh, here are in that category of low threshold procurement, pretty around some of the construction projects that we have. So. It's quite right that, that the, the issue is raised as a concern and that you know we will monitor uh, that arrangement, uh, keep, in, keep it in the eye of the Cabinet Office for that sort of east-west thing. But for the north-south bit, it does start to move towards uh, being a trade issue. And we need to have a discussion then as, as to how the, you know, if, if a situation was developing, how that would be best uh, raised, and I think that's our view may well be that that's something that the Department for Economy might want to take on. I'm not sure uh, CPD would have the remit uh, be involved in that, but certainly, you know, obviously we're we're committed to making sure public procurement works in a north, south, east, west arrangement, and we have raised the issue. Uh, 
with the Cabinet Office on, on that guidance note um, that's been produced for England. Thank you. Yes. Can I just ask on the, on the North South bit specifically, is there, uh, you, you said you'd, you'd keep in touch with the CEF, two part question, have the CEF or indeed any firm come to you with a specific example of it not working or them being excluded from a, um, a, a tender uh, under threshold? And then point two, um, is, it, is there a case for uh, someone doing a specific bit of work to, 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 to other than just the, you know, the, 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 the trade group? So, you know, a, a public body, whether it's yourselves, the economy or Intertrade Ireland, doing a, a job of scoping and getting information to see if it's, if it's, um, if it's an issue? I, I, missed, I missed some of that, unfortunately. But I think, as I said, if, if it's uh, an issue that, that for example, uh, a contractor here is told that, you know, there are enough contractors in Bradford, then certainly we would start to pursue that. Uh, with the cabinet office to see, uh, you know, how that uh, arrangement has come about, or whether that's the right thing for an internal market. But if we find, for example, that we have feedback that there's a developing situation uh, in the Republic of Ireland, then you know, our jurisdiction, you know, our our remit, the CPD, would prevent us, I suppose, um, having any sort of dialogue down that way. But we'd certainly be passing that type of information on to our colleagues. I think probably. In the Department for Economy. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, Jim? Yeah, just to be clear, so is procurement now largely a protocol free zone? A protocol? Well, public procurement is uh, targeted at uh, procuring those needs that the partners have. In Northern Ireland to meet their business objectives, so it is. I mean, it, it's governed by a wider set of rules internationally. But in terms of operational issues, it's around those types of things that departments need, whether they're works, services, or supplies, to carry out their functions and to deliver the services that they need to the citizens. So it's an end to that aspect. Once the the overarching rules are set. The arrangements then that, that come out of any protocols or changes in other international matters, other legislation or processes um, are impacted by virtue of how the departments react to that situation. So, sorry, so it's you're... not it's not so much a procurement lead, I suppose, as you know, as a commissioning issue or a oh. uh, a requirement from a department. Maybe you misunderstood me. I was asking. Is procurement now free of any impact of the EU protocol, the Ireland Northern Ireland protocol? Well, only I mean any aspect that, uh, in terms of where it falls, in terms of the procedure that you go through to award a contract, that is, it's not a, it's not impacted. If there are wider impacts in terms of what's happening in terms of wider trade issues or you know, uh, pandemics or whatever. I mean, that's that's just almost becomes the supply chain issue. I think you know, getting materials, we understand, are getting a bit more difficult. It's it's bringing stuff in is a bit slowed up. Um, but the actual procurement process and awarding the contract is set and defined now. Well, let me put it slightly differently. Are we now free of the 2014 directive? the most economically advantageous tender? The, the directives were transposed into the public contracts regulations uh, 2015. Those are still in place. Uh, they have been modified slightly to make them operational in the short term until a wider set of uh, reviews is undertaken right. and new but, regulations are brought in for, you know, for the UK. But the, but, the, the regulations that we had uh, in December are still the regulations that we have now, except for a few changes, just in operational changes, really, in terms, for example, how we work with e-tenders and the call for tenders. But the December 20 Cabinet Office Green Paper uh, on transforming public procurement and on the creation of a UK-wide procurement policy, it proposed moving to replace meat the most economically advantageous tender to the most advantageous tender. 
Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. The, but but it currently, as we as we sit here at the moment, it's still neat because that's a carry cross from the agreements that we had on terms of the 2015 regulations. But the um, the ambition and intention, these awful acronyms, is to move from meat to mat. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, meat to mat, and I suppose the, the the purpose of that is to give her give greater scope to, to allow the procurement uh, decision-making process to take into a wider set of, yeah. uh, of concerns as to how the contract is awarded and to make it... Uh, if you move with something that is the most economical and advantageous standard, then you're drawn towards more towards the pricing mechanism. Um, the, the new arrangements are intended to give a greater balance to allow you to take into account environmental issues and social issues and obviously with the impact of the pandemic uh, i think we need to look at how public procurement supports that sort of recovery phase uh, and and the intention then is to is to be a bit more balanced we have been criticized as opposed here about driving too hard on price uh, and that you know that that reduces a race to the bottom uh, we are looking within the, with the procurement board as to how we might balance out uh, that type of uh, consideration in the contract of work phase. So, yeah, it's straight for that, I suppose, is where we're going to be. Yeah. The other uh, final question I wanted to ask you, uh, has the Dunlop review ever been published? Oh, oh. Jim, just um, for guidance, what was just like the rest of us. What Sorry. Is... What's that review? There was a review launched by the UK government in July 2019 called the Dunlop Review, which was to focus to ensure that within the context of the existing devolution settlements, we are working to the most effective way possible to realise fully all the benefits of being a United Kingdom. The government on the 8th of February, the Secretary of State for Wales, in a written answer in the House of Commons, said that it's the government's ambition to publish the Dunlop report as soon as possible, alongside a full response from the government. The report is an important contribution to the debate on strengthening the union, a key government priority. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking, is there any indication of the Dunlop review being published? Well, do you, are you across any of this? Uh, I would have to. I'm not aware of it. Oh, something I can get back to the committee on. Okay. Committee, we, if it's okay, sure, we, we can come back on that point. Okay, thank you. Okay, cheers. Okay. Go on. Oh, sorry, Gemma, sorry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Paul. Des. Um, just one question. Um, would trade union recognition be something that should be considered when considering what constitutes social value? Well, it's, do you want to, I, I mean, we are looking, we are looking at, um, with the procurement board, in terms of uh, new policy in relation to how social value is brought through in, in the procurement process. Um, currently, the bi-social uh, model is, is a primarily the method that's used by departments to deliver social value through their procurements. But we would wish to, to widen that. Uh, and in particular, we'd like to look at how fair work uh, for employment is brought through and ensured in the procurement process. Now, with anything with the procurement process, you have to be careful that there are limitations imposed by virtue of the fact that the EU wanted public procurement to be a, a key driver in opening up markets and su to suppliers across the EU. So the primary driver there was, you know, was to allow uh, contractors in. What we're sort of developing our thoughts on is, is around the type of supplier that's needed if you want to deliver social value. And that seems to be a type of supplier who is careful about how they do their employment and whether that's trade union membership or not, but certainly it's a debate that that's, we're starting to open up with the procurement board at the moment, is the how uh, for work, uh, for representation is considered. And obviously with the construction employers federation, for example, they already have a working agreement, I believe with UCAT, that demonstrates how 
trade unions can work with you know particular sector other sectors are not well as well shipped and there is an opportunity as opposed to the procurement process to try and uh, push some of that again if that's an executive's priority and it's uh, a policy that's been developed and tested by the procurement board and i think that sets us off down that journey if that's what the executive decides is a priority for its public procurement expenditure yeah, just add that that CPD does have this this issue slightly addressed, and it has a CPD supplier code of conduct that it asks suppliers to sign up to before entering into any contract with us. And that actually specifically um, um, addresses the fact that nobody should be discriminated against based on trade union membership. And just to back up Ezra's point about the procurement board or the procurement board that the. Owen Reedy, the, from the Irish Congress, the trade unions is actually a member of the board now. Mm -hmm. So those views will be represented going forward on the board. Yeah, that's great. I did actually notice that Owen was on the board, and I welcome that. And so thanks for that answer. That's just me, Chair. Okay, thanks. And Gemma, my apologies. I didn't mean to call it Joanne. I was just the way I was reading it. I was going, why is there a Joanne on this list here? <laughs> I mean, call her. Don't worry. No, you know I wouldn't, under no circumstances. Pat, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much. Um, sorry about the sound, but uh, can officials can you advise? I'm just looking at the, uh, uh, the Central Procurement Directive as part of the public uh, the policy. The Executive established the Procurement Board um, and the Central Procurement on, on that directive. It's the UK Public Contracts Regulation, most of which applies across most of the UK and some of which is implemented in EU directives. So it comes to, can the officials advise on the current degree to which public procurement in Northern Ireland remains a devolved matter? Or is there a possibility yeah, that that yeah. can be taken completely away from us? Sorry, I lost, lost a bit of that again, but just to confirm that, that public procurement is a devolved matter. Um, and we do have the opportunity here to develop um, our own regulations, if that's uh, what we wish to do. But in previous regulation drafting, uh, ministers have agreed to join with England and Wales. So you will see that we have the public contracts regulations uh, 2015, which cover England, Wales and Northern Ireland. But within that, there's part of the regulations that do not apply to Northern Ireland because we were able, even as part of that joined up approach, to put in place uh, a requirement for Northern Ireland to have an exemption to some of the work that was being done uh, and being carried through those regulations. So there is, there is a possibility for Northern Ireland to produce its own regulations. And that could be, that obviously would take a bit of time to bring yourself out of the joint up approach that we currently have with England and Wales. Um, um, but it is possible if that's the, the direction that the executive decides to take. So the procurement legislation that states here seems to flow from the UK public contracts regulations. So 2015, most of which applies across most of the UK. So, I mean, yes, it is here. You do say that it is part of the vault administration, but as we've seen over the past two weeks, can there be a grab on this completely to align us with with the UK um, public contracts regulations? Well, uh, I mean, uh, uh, as a further example of the vault administrations, you know, producing their own regulations, you can see that Scotland have this, uh, their own regulations, although they're, they're broadly similar to the, the grouping that we have with England. Uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. So uh, I can't comment on on how those are developed uh, going forward or what the intentions would be. But there is an opportunity, if if because this is the ball matter for Northern Ireland to strike its own regulations. All right. Thanks. So look, I just want to go on. Yesterday, I had a meeting with Social Enterprise, and I, I'm just trying to get what is the link up. Can, can you advise us to propose social value in the procurement bill, and how will the department access social value? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the, one, of, one of the key um, policy initiatives that, that the procurement board 
reconstitute the procurement board is taken forward is how to uh, make social value uh, more effectively uh, deployed through the procurement process. And that's why I suppose the minister has invited uh, a number of industry advisors and sector advisors to call just as there are from social, social enterprise and I. Um, so we have, we've had a pretty good meeting, I think, about how this may be uh, progressed going forward. I think there's broad support for the concept of social value through procurement. I think there are uh, a number of views as to how the best way of taking this forward uh, you know, could be made. Um, but that's that's what the board is considering at the moment. And we have already made some initial proposals, which we've discussed and debated. There is, there is a number of ways you can go with this. You can either make it a, a mandatory requirement for the contract, or you can put it in a scoring mechanism uh, that leads to the award of the contract. Uh, and there's some examples of both of those approaches. And I suppose what we're looking at at the moment is, well, what is the best way forward? Is it a single approach of one of, one of either of those two approaches or a combined approach or something else? And we have some plans yet uh, to go through uh, before we, we can put a paper to the minister that he might wish to take the executive. Well, thanks, thanks, Joe. Yeah. That's right. Just a quick one. On the open contracting data standard OCDS, which is the new, I understand that's the new digital sharing system, which is supposed to have all the data on it. Have you had any feedback yet on how it's working? Or have people been fairly happy with it, sort of putting the data on it? Um, well, Paul, do we have just coming in on that one? Again, I would, I would prefer to revert back to the committee later to that. I need to check that with Yeah, because I mean... But sure, if we could come back on, on feedback, but I, I'm not aware of any uh, major concerns being raised, uh, certainly with me. Um, yeah. But we have been committed in, in producing, uh, you know, an openness around the data sharing. And uh, but if you don't mind, if we could come back on that specific point. Yeah, no, it, it, it's just interesting because obviously, look, now we've moved away from the people have been used to working on the sort of OGEC system, and now, as I understand it, that ended at the end of the year, except for those things that specifically have an EU procurement aspect of it. So obviously, we're now into a new system uh, across the board. And just noting some of the things that's been coming out of central government over the last uh, couple of days, particularly about sort of bigger procurement issues, and um, particularly sort of in think areas like defence contracting and sort of some of the other areas in sort of the the t science and technology world. There's been a re there's been a really fundamental shift in a short period of time. I just wondered, uh, and again, maybe this is something you could look at, and maybe through the procurement board itself. Ask them if they've got any concerns that have been raised and any issues that they have, because I would be very surprised if we ended up with a new form of government database where it was all working swimmingly well. I think we should note that if that was the case, indeed, as sort of a, an exemplar. But I haven't heard anything, which um, I just wondered if you'd heard anything, so maybe that would be useful. But if you could come back to us, that would be great. Yes, yes sir. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, Mesa. Good chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a few questions, um, and a word that's continuously repeated uh, throughout when talking about procurement and so on uh, is uh, and how local is local. I know that in my case, local to me is Balabafe, which is in Donegal, just across the road from me. Uh, so how local is local? And again, too, it's the same sort of uh, implication then in relation to both uh, firms in the north of Ireland uh, competing, we'll say, in the Republic, the Republic of Ireland, uh, procuring here in the north, and then uh, east west as well. Yeah, I think that I think obviously that um, you know if, if you're in a local council, for example, um, then obviously your your focus is on the particular citizens that, that live within your area, and and that's really you tend to want to circulate the cash within the particular area for the benefit in terms of employment or whatever else there is. Um, the risk is, I suppose, is that everybody does that, um, but businesses don't operate solely just across those particular local boundaries, uh, whether it's council, 
or regional or uh, devolved administration. Our, our view, I suppose, is that it's, it's for our, con our contractors and our suppliers, it's better if there's an open market and that they can export. Not only can they meet the requirements of public procurement here, but they can also export and do business in other parts of these islands and further afield. And that, you know, we personally, what CPD's view has always been to try and maintain that openness that is a core of the public procurement regulations that have been there in the past. And, um, you know, I, I think I may have mentioned before, I was at a, at a conference one time where, where a guy from Manchester stood up and said how they were able to contain their spend within the Manchester area. And a guy got up from Liverpool and said, well, we were doing exactly the same. And then a guy got on the floor and said, but my white van was up and down the M62 both ways. Could you please let me go across both of your areas and do a bit of business for you? So there is that local, obviously that local focus. Um, but I do, I do think that, you know, when we get into a situation where we have city deals in that, then maybe where we have specific data that suggests a particular area needs a benefit from uh, public procurement expenditure, and that can be clearly demonstrated by some sort of data that, you know, it's rational that that's why you want, want to do it. And you can target those areas. Maybe that's where we join up some of the, the funding arrangements um, with the public procurement bit and grants, and that would better than uh, more of a holistic view of how monies are being spent in a particular area to benefit citizens. I think that's a bit of work maybe that the board can take forward in the future. And I think that's a, an excellent example too. And if you made the city deal, given that even much of the work that will happen in my own uh, region uh, will be supported by the Dublin government and the Donegal side of the border as well too. But just if we can move on to another element, which uh, in fact will come to the fore quite possibly just in the same context, and that again too is about social value, uh, and that where presentations that we've had to date, and I know that I think it's in Britain that social value uh, at present is with the social like ten percent. Whereas when we had a representation here from the industry and so on, they were not from the industry, but from the, um, the uh, representatives from those of the social economy as such. They were suggesting it should uh, at least be a third, uh, e in terms of social value uh, with. Um, um, you know, we're against um, uh, the, the, the value and price and so on. Uh, do you have an opinion on that? Yes, I think I think what we need to do with as we as the procurement board develops this policy that hopefully will go to the executive is to make a start on this in the best possible way that gives the best possible opportunity for success early. I think. With these procurement policies, they, they're not always set in stone and shouldn't be set in stone. But it's very important that you have a policy setting off that has a really good prospect of success. Once you have that in place, confidence grows around the system and therefore you can develop off that, that success. And I think it's important that we allow a bit of time for the, the players right across the procurement function that's the people who commission services, who are budget holders in departments, the procurement professionals who, are, who undertake the procurement for those particular departments, and the link up between the private sector and the social economy and other players who are actually delivering those contracts for government. And if we can get a, a consistent view as how we might start down a journey of improving social value and learning as we go and changing as we go and increasing the the, the things that do that produce good behaviors we want to increase and those things that are producing counterproductive behaviors or inadvertent uh, issues then those are the things we want to pick up and learn from so i see this really as a bit of a journey and that yeah. but i would we just need to be careful that we don't uh, kill the thing off by making the, the, the you know the early steps into this uh, too big a stride and uh, I'm sure you'd agree with me, uh, as, the, as the case to that much training will be required uh, in order for uh, officers to be able to uh, evaluate uh, social value in itself. Yeah, I think that, that I mean, that's, that's a, a very valid point. I think the, the assessment of these tenders then becomes a critical point, because if you're going to produce uh, 
you know, assessments that are built across both uh, finance, the economy, and, and the environment, if you can put those patches together, then you do need to have expertise, panel members who can make that decision and award to the right supplier, and can then make sure that the supplier is supported in fully delivering those commitments and that, you know, that it doesn't become a, a, an essay rating exercise just at the point of award, but these things are followed through. And those benefits that are, I suppose, promised as part of the procurement process are actually put into effect. Yeah. And finally, just um, uh, are you aware, we'll say, to what extent, we'll say, contracts press either uh, a great extent or, or, or much too low are awarded on the basis of source of value? Uh, the social value, I think, I think that the SIB have, have, will have details uh, on the amount of uh, contracts that have gone through the buy social model, and we can get that information uh, for you. I yeah, think the, the issue, I suppose, is, is that how do you widen that out into other areas? It's largely focused, I suppose, on construction. They've done really good work around IT and uh, some other sectors, um, but we have a I think CPD is a tender at the moment for the department, and we're looking at a ten percent score on on the award of the contract, and that will allow us to test some of our ideas going forward that we can then you know bring into the conversation with the procurement board. But in terms of the by social model, SIB will will have a data on that, and we can ask for that for you. I really appreciate that, and I also appreciate the clarity of all of your answers, Rex. Thank you. Okay, Alicia, if you're happy, I'll ask. I think the committee will write to the SIB for that detail as well, so we get it from them. If you're content. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Des, Paul, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for your evidence, and uh, sorry for the comms difficulties to begin with, and the rest of it. And if we can take Thank both you, and Paul out of the spotlight. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Be Thank safe. You. Okay, team. Uh, are there any other? I think we've got a couple of actions there that we came through that uh, note to the SIB. So it's the Dunlop review, the OCDS progress, and the uh, SIB social value yep. contracts. If we're content to take those forward, content. Great. Uh, and uh, we were asked to consider the response to the Minister in respect to the Public Procurement Common Framework as set out on page 55 of the tabled items. Is the Committee content to seek assurances that the Minister will make use of the agreed PPCF consultation and dispute resolution for it in order to secure the greatest possible access for local firms to public procurement throughout the UK, whilst limiting the adverse impacts of administration change proposed by the UK Government in the Green Paper? Are we content? Uh, is the committee content to seek assurance from the minister that changes to procurement which clearly lie within the devolved competency, i.e. the improved provision of social value and procurement, etc., will not be stymied by the application of the agreed PPCF? Are we agreed? Agreed. Is the committee content to agree, uh, agree to give further consideration to the possible impact of any of the application of the Northern Ireland Protocol and the UK Internal Market Act 2020? on access to public procurement specifically for Northern Ireland-based firms, both in the rest of the UK and in the Republic of Ireland? I think it's important we clarify there, Chair, when we talk about the protocol, the protocol does not apply to, uh, we shouldn't be using this language, and I have to be absolutely clear about this, the protocol does not apply to procurement. We've now tested that argument to destruction. Um, the points that we're talking about are, in the sense, things that are not in the protocol, if you want to take it down that line. I just think we should be clear that we mean post-Brexit trading arrangements, because it clearly does not, uh, the protocol is not, uh, other than indirect impacts around goods movement, but that's not about the actual legal process of procurement. Uh, well, I, just to, I'd like to broaden that out, because obviously one of the issues with the Northern Ireland Protocol is that we're not aware of yet of the implications, that implications around issues to do with state aid. Uh, issues to do with um, various sort of issues to do with taxation, with other regulations and the rest of it. So there's a whole raft of things that we're not even aware of yet that may have implications. There's so, a whole raft. Yeah, pardon me. So that that I think is that that is the point. We you know we're being asked to um, we're asked to give you know we're asked to keep our ears open and keep our scrutiny open for potential changes that are coming downstream. Uh, personally, my my own view is that if 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 
Now, this is going into correspondence, or is this our? I think if we're doing that, it's my own view that we should have. If, if the word protocol is going to be in there, we have to have to preface it post Brexit arrangements because we know in relation to this issue around below threshold procurement, it is clear from what um, the Construction Employers Federation told us and from what. Um, uh, uh, you not, not, not when to cut across it, but I'm more than happy to say post Brexit and Northern Ireland Protocol as well, so if you're okay. content. Just to move it on. Okay, content. And then ask members are we content to send a response to the Minister? This is page 55 of the tabled items, as amended. Are we agreed? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Move on to the next item on the agenda uh, oral presentation on the withdrawal agreement structures. Sean, are you with us? She is there. Let's see if we can get her in the spotlight. Yeah. Hi, Shauna. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, Good to see you, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Tim, we're talking about this is a briefing from the Assembly Secretariat and it's designed to inform members' understanding of issues relating to the EU withdrawal. The Assembly Secretariat can provide a political opinion. That's good for that. And the information provided in the briefing should not be considered to be a, a, a political opinion. And I think you'd be glad of that, Shauna, as well. And I think more than enough of us can sort of get stuck into that if, if we yeah. need be. But uh, the papers are relevant to this uh, item. Papers on the withdrawal agreement structures and background information are on page 124 to 146. Correspondence from the House of Lords EU Affairs Committee on the operation of the protocol, page 147. Papers on the Shared Prosperity Fund and Community Real Renewal Fund are at page 163. And a note of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and formal meeting on the Northern Ireland Protocol on page 170. Shauna, over to you, please. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, what I was just going to do is I'm going to try and share my screen here um, and just talk please, please. through um, one of these diagrams because actually it um, it's can be um, a little bit uh, tricky to understand all these various um, bodies. So, I thought this might be uh, an easier approach. Can everybody see that? Uh, yeah. Page one three eight of your packs, members. If you're yeah, page one three eight. Yeah, one three eight. Okay. Okay. Um, well, really, what I propose to do, Chair, is just run through this. I'm obviously happy to take uh, questions at the end. Um, so, really, this diagram was created to try and give some context to the various uh, bodies uh, for intergovernmental relations and also EU relations. So as such, some of these are, are perhaps unnatural bedfellows. So you shouldn't really take these to have any ascribing any kind of uh, relative importance. It's purely just as a, as a visual aid. Um, so if we start at the top left, then um, we can see the UK government has obviously a number of cabinet committee structures. Um, and for our purposes in terms of EU relations, there are two key ones. There's the so-called XO committee or the uh, Exit Operations Committee. And it is the committee, cabinet committee created to focus on the oper operational decisions to support Brexit readiness. It is chaired by the Chancellor of the Dutch of Lancaster, Michael Gove. And EXO really took over work that would have been previously done by the Department for Exiting the EU. Uh, before the end of the transition period, EXO met frequently uh, and it involves both ministers and officials and it has continued to meet uh, in 2021. The First Minister and Deputy First Minister and or the Junior Ministers in the Executive Office participate in the meetings of EXO. And the EXO Committee's terms of reference are to implement the withdrawal agreement and deliver the policy and operational transition to the new international relationships. Um, also, uh, there is a Cabinet Committee called XS, um, and it uh, focuses more on the strategic decisions on EU exit as opposed to the operational decisions dealt with by EXO. Uh, for example, the final decisions on the approach to the negotiations were taken in the Excess Committee, and the Prime Minister chairs that particular Cabinet Committee. Uh, its remit is to consider matters relating to the UK's trade priorities, including free trade agreements, the multilateral trade system, and interlinkages with domestic economy. Beneath there, I have showed three different uh, fora, which are um, attended by devolved ministers. And there are a number of these intergovernmental structures uh, to enable the government to engage with the devolved governments uh, on key issues. Um, I've listed three there, um, but also it's important to note that some other ones are on, uh, on an ad hoc basis, uh, for example, uh, in relation to COVID-19 um, and the COP26 uh, forum uh, for collaboration on the 2021 United Nations Climate Conference. 
So just to outline those three there, we have the Finance Minister's Quadrilateral, sometimes called fin, FinQuad, Finance Quad, or FMQ. Um, we do love an acronym. Um, that essentially brings together Treasury Ministers and Finance Ministers of the devolved administrations. And for example, discussions around shared prosperity fund, etc., would take place at that quadrilateral. In the centre there, we have the Joint Ministerial Committee uh, on European Negotiations. And the wider J Joint Ministerial Committee, or JMC, structure was created following devolution in 1999. Um, and the terms of reference for Joint Ministerial Committee are set out in an MOU agreed between the governments of the UK, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland in 1999. Um, the Prime Minister chairs the Joint Ministerial Committee when it meets in plenary format, along with the First Ministers from Scotland, Wales and the First and Deputy Minister from Northern Ireland. Um, ministers from the Cabinet also attend these plenary meetings depending on the issue that is being discussed. According to the MOU, the Joint Ministerial Committee meets in plenary format at least once a year. However, it hasn't had it held a meeting since December 2018. The terms of JMC are to consider non-devolved matters impinging on devolved responsibilities and devolved matters impinging on non-devolved responsibilities. Uh, they. It's a forum for UK government and devolved administrations to agree to consider devolved matters if it is beneficial to discuss their respective treatment in the UK uh, and also to consider disputes between the administrations. So underneath that wider JMC structure, there are a number of subcommittees and the prime one here is the Joint Ministerial Committee on European Negotiations Subcommittee and it was established in November 2016 as the primary focus for multilateral ministerial engagement on EU exit. And its original objective was to agree a UK approach to and objectives for Article 50 negotiations. Um, and meetings were attended by UK ministers and ministers from the Welsh Government, Scottish Government and Northern Ireland Executive. They're chaired by Michael Gove. Um, the meetings at uh, JMCEN dealt with implementation of agreements between UK and EU, including the protocol, arrangements for end of the transition period and common frameworks and it is JMCEN which is the ultimate body for dealing with common frameworks and which will sign those off. Uh, and then the third group there is the uh, EFRA interministerial group where ministers from uh, the environment, food and rural affairs portfolios across the UK meet uh, regularly. Just to point out here um, on the wider issue of intergovernmental relations uh, in 2018, in, in March 2018, the Joint Ministerial Committee agreed uh, to undertake a review of intergovernmental relations across the UK. That has not yet been published. And then Theresa May ordered in July 19 uh, for Lord Dunlop to do a review of union capability. Um, it's understood that that, that report was with, has been uh, finalised and finished and has been with government since November 2019, but it hasn't been published. And as of last month, Chloe Smith, the Minister for uh, the Constitution, indicated that the government hopes to publish both those reviews at the same time, so the Lord Dunlop Review and the IGR Review. Um, there is no date yet. It's imminent, and it has been imminent for some, some time. Uh, moving down then, we have the Northern Ireland Executive. Um, and uh, in New Decade, New Approach, um, the Northern Ireland Executive was to set up a Brexit subcommittee. Uh, and that was established in February 2020. It was a non-decision making body and included representation from each of the parties on the executive. Um, but um, the executive has responded to say that in light of the fact that the executive needs to be agile, um, it agreed in March 2020 to replace the Brexit subcommittee, which had no decision making powers, with an arrangement whereby specific meetings of the executive uh, have a single agenda focus on EU exit related matters. Um, and that has a focus on considering and where possible agreeing a common policy approach on all relevant issues to influence the UK negotiators, the Irish government and the EU. To consider and where possible agree a common policy approach on implementation of the executive's default responsibilities in implementing decisions and policies adopted by the UK Parliament and or Joint Committee. Uh, and developing an executive response to managing the impacts of EU exit, and developing proposals to maximise influence and realisation of opportunities arising from implementation of the withdrawal agreement, including the protocol and the future relationship with the EU and the rest of the world. I understand you've got the full terms of reference uh, in your pack at page 139. Um, over to the left there, then we have the NIO Business Engagement Forum. 
Um, the government committed in May, its May 2020 command paper that it would engage with Northern Ireland businesses to discuss the proposals and to provide feedback on the free flow of trade. So the NIO set up a business engagement forum and the first meeting was held in June 2020 and executive ministers do attend those meetings. Um, and at the bottom of the diagram there, you have the EU Future Relations Board, which reports upwards to the Executive um, Committee on EU Exit. So the EU Future Relations Board is chaired by the Permanent Secretary of the Executive Office and comprises the Permanent Secretaries from the Departments of Infrastructure, Economy, Justice, Finance, Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Uh, the Office of Legislative Council and the Department of Solicitor's Office also are represented. Um, but it is likely that that may change in the future. Do you understand that? Um, moving now into the future relationship with the EU, that there may be some uh, amendment to the internal structures at the executive level. So moving over to the right-hand side then, I have uh, laid out there the structures of the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement. So uh, in green there, you can see the joint committee, specialised committee on the protocol and the joint consultative working group. Um, and you can see that actually the structures of the TCA mirror that structure somewhat. So um, I will move on just to the withdrawal agreement. So um, the primary tier of governance in the withdrawal agreement is the joint committee, and that is responsible for the implementation and application of the withdrawal agreement. Um, it, it, two key threads. One is to uh, the power to adopt decisions to amend the withdrawal agreement, um, but only for a limited set of reasons, such as where amendments are necessary to correct errors, to address some emissions or other deficiencies, or to address situations unforeseen when the withdrawal agreement was signed. Um, the power, that power has been used in the past um, to make some amendments to the withdrawal agreement. Uh, the Joint Committee provides a forum to resolve disputes regarding application, and also then if the disputes can't be resolved, they have an arbitration panel. Um, and in December 2020, they did publish the list of people who would serve as members of such an arbitration panel. Um, the Joint Committee had a key task before the end of the transition period to decide a number of issues, primarily in relation to the identification of goods not at risk of moving into the single market. Um, the Joint Committee is co-chair in the UK and the EU. Previously, Michael Gove, but now Lord Frost is the UK co-chair, and Maros Stefkovic is the EU co-chair. Um, a new decade, new approach. The government made a commitment to ensure that representatives from the Northern Ireland Executive would be invited to be part of the EU delegation to the Joint Committee meetings or indeed the Specialised Committee meetings. The Joint Committee must meet at least once a year and it formally met five times in 2020. Um, and the government, in relation to its uh, going forward, it has said that the Joint Committee will continue to meet after the end of the transition period for as long as necessary. And indeed, its last meeting was on the 24th of February. Um, the Joint Committee meetings do take place in private, but uh, the government, um, UK and EU together, published some joint statements on any decisions following the meetings. Um, and the government has committed to providing written ministerial statements in advance and following each meeting of the Joint Committee. So underneath the Joint Committee, then, there were a series of specialised committees which focused on the main issues of the withdrawal agreement. Uh, and primarily for our attention here today is the Committee on the Protocol, um, which you can see is one of those key committees. Um, it has a specific function outlined in Article 14 of the Protocol, and that is to examine proposals concerning the implementation and application of the Protocol from the North-South Ministerial Council and North-South Implementation Body set up under the 1998 Agreement, and to consider any matter of relevance to Article 2 of the Protocol brought to its attention by the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland and the Joint Committee of Representatives of the Human Rights Commissions of Ireland and Northern Ireland. So you can see that's represented there on, on the diagram. Um, and the specialised committee is uh, officials, it's not ministers, it's attended by officials, and therefore um, there's limited information available in terms of scrutiny. However, some uh, joint statements and notes of the meetings have been published following. Um, the bottom layer then really of the governance, which also feeds into the specialised committee, is the Joint Consultative Working Group. Um, it's composed again of officials and representatives of the UK and EU carry out the functions under the speci specialised committee. It has no power to make binding decisions, but can adopt its own rules of procedure. Um, it has to provide an annual report of its work by the 1st of February every year and submit that to the specialised committee. 
and the function of this joint consultative working group is to serve as a forum for the exchange of information and mutual consultation in relation to the implementation of EU law in Northern Ireland and amendments or replacements to EU legislation. So I suppose a key point of stay here is that the working group is the forum where the EU will inform the UK about planned European Union acts which will fall within the scope of the protocol, including any EU acts that amend or replace um, the legislation listed in the annexes to the protocol. That group will meet once a month. Um, the rules of procedure were agreed at a meeting at the end of January. These meetings are confidential unless decided otherwise by the co-chairs, but the co-chairs can decide to release the minutes and summaries of the meeting. And again, the UK government has given the commitment that uh, Northern Ireland executive officials can be part of any UK delegation uh, attending those uh, meetings. Uh, and just finally then, just in terms of the trade and cooperation agreement, similar structures um, in that it has uh, three main tiers. So the Joint Partnership Council is the tier at the top, and again, co-chaired between the UK and the EU by Lord Frost and Maris Stefkovic. Uh, it is in charge of the political oversight of the TCA. Uh, it has to meet at least once a year. Um, it may meet in public as a decision of the co-chairs, and its agenda and minutes will be made public. It's this body that decided, for example, to uh, extend the process for ratification uh, at the European Parliament to the 30th of April. Um, Key tasks for the TPC are to oversee the objectives of the agreement, to supervise the implementation of the agreement, to uh, establish trade specialised committees and specialised committees, to dis resolve disputes at political level, um, and for example, to review the implementation of the fisheries agreement. So underneath that, then again, a series of specialised committees, which report upwards to the JPC. Um, and their tasks are to monitor the implementation of the relevant chapters of the agreement. They do the preparatory work for the Partnership Council. They are forums to exchange information. Um, and they are assisted by technical working groups, which are listed in grey there at the bottom. And these four technical working groups are related to social security coordination, medicinal products, organic products, and motor vehicles. Um, in terms of the operation of all the various bodies, worth pointing out that the UK government doesn't want them to do any work until ratification takes place. Um, and as I mentioned, their ratification isn't due to take place in the European Parliament before the 30th, until the 30th of April, although it, it may be earlier. Um, there are a couple of other bodies there, quickly, just to point out. In the top uh, right, you can see a partnership parliamentary assembly. And that is going to be a body to be established between the European Parliament and the Parliament in Westminster. Um, it will be a forum to exchange views on the agreement and it may request uh, information regarding the implementation of the agreement and may make recommendations through to the Partnership Council. That body hasn't been established yet and as I said it will be between the European Parliament and the House of Commons and House of Lords to establish that body but I understand the President of the European Parliament has written to the Lord Speaker in the Lords and to the Speaker of the House of Commons to make preparations to establish that body. There is no commitment as yet for the um, devolved administrations, the devolved parliaments to be part of that UK delegation. However, I do know that the Scottish Parliament has written to the European Parliament and to the Commons and the Lords uh, to that effect. Um, and the Committee for the Executive Office has also written to the Commons and the Lords to that effect. And finally, then over on the left there, we have a Civic Society Forum, which is um, for both parties, the UK and the EU, to make their own arrangements to consult with civic society about the operation of any aspect of the um, TCA and that the, the, these bodies, the Civic Society Forum, can conduct any uh, type of dialogue at once and shall meet at least once a year um, and uh, it will be open to participation of, of any civic society groups as deemed necessary by each party. So that was a very quick gallop through what is quite a complex um, set of structures here. So very happy to take questions. Okay, Shauna, thanks very much indeed. And thanks very much indeed for your comprehensive brief. Uh, Matthew? Uh, yeah, thank you, Shauna. That was a really helpful brief. I, I just have one um, factual question. Uh, we we have strong, strong opinions in these matters in this committee, but we're, you're giving us a really good factual brief. Just in, in your research, did the the... British Irish, so the, some of the G, GFA um, institutions have occasionally reared their head, unless you, you, you mentioned them and I missed them. Yep. So two ones, obviously the uh, British Irish Intergovernmental 
Council in relation to some of these matters and also NSMC? Um, uh, are there any formality or what level of formality has been put around those, um, their engagement in these? Um, they, there are arrangements for, um, so in the second tier of um, the governance within the withdrawal agreement with the specialised committee on the protocol, it has been set up um, and it is uh, the body to which the North-South Ministerial Council and other North-South bodies established under the 1998 agreement will feed into the work of that committee, which then will feed up to the joint committee. And indeed, the First Minister mentioned in questions, I think in January, that uh, NSMC have been commissioned to um, commissioned officials to work out uh, indeed how that process of referring matters to the specialised committee within the withdrawal agreement will work. Okay, so, so their role is the role within the, the, the is to report to specialised committee to make report to make represent and, that is, and is that on. Uh, operation of the protocol more generally, or is it on specific? Er so, for example, NSMC will obviously, when it was set up, a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, their work was around e you know spending EU money and you know cross border or um, specific issues. Is it just more generally in relation to the protocol, or is it specifically on spending and like P peace plus etc.? It, it literally, it's um, Article 14 sort of gives uh, of the protocol outlines the exact nature of their engagement. And that says to examine proposals concerning the implementation and application of the protocol from the North South Ministerial Council on North South implementation bodies. So that is quite a broad, um, a broad uh, description of their role. Um, as I say, we haven't yet seen anything formal come from any of those bodies about how they plan to do that engagement. Okay. But NSF are looking at how that's going to work. So there may be something more forthcoming on that. Right. Okay. And then lastly, if I may, Chair, just on JMC, having been. Around in the UK, yep. as a civil servant, whenever JMC first is it had his first difficult birth, and then it's, it's hasn't really um, done any sense. No, exactly. Uh, it, so <laughs> JMC EAN basically doesn't really exist anymore. It's last met in, in late 2018. 2018. Has anything replaced it as a other than the other JMC? But that is not quite doing what we needed to do now. There hasn't been a new JMC for. The, for the, the post-TCA UK-EU relationship, leaving aside the protocol, the broader issues that affect all four devolved devolves, no? There is That's no, correct. Yeah. Henry hasn't met uh, since uh, 2018, so JMCEN is really, as I mentioned, there's been a number of subcommittees over the years, but the, part, the one that's been really meeting most regularly is the one on uh, JMCEN on Article 50, but it hasn't really been meeting other than clearing common framework for written procedures since um, the start of this year. Right, yeah. The new IGR review and the Dunlop review will feed into the future of JMCEN and what those structures might look like, but obviously that hasn't been published yet either. So um, there's a bit of a, a situation, a sort of a, we're in a bit of a stasis at the minute as to what the future ever intergovernmental relations structures are going to look like now that we're in uh, the post-transition period. Ah, yes, Andrew Dunlop's review, which, hasn't, which has been mentioned before, but not is... OK, that's, that's my question. Thank you. Yep. Shauna, just a, just a quick one, just a follow-up from that. In the alphabet soup of all these various committees that there are, quite a few of them haven't actually sat, and quite a few of them haven't actually been established or names been put forward to them. Have you managed to, in your research, had an opportunity to see which ones have actually been populated? Because I think just looking at some of the stuff I've seen from both in the House of Commons and, the, and also some of the stuff I've been talking to people in Brussels recently, is that there are, there are very few of these are actually up and running or people have even been nominated for them. Yes, so if we look at the withdrawal agreement out of the three tiers, we only really know, um, we've only really seen the working of the Joint Committee and the Specialised Committee. The Joint Consultative Working Group uh, held one meeting at the end of February that lasted, I think, five or seven minutes, and it purely was to agree the rules of procedure. We're still no clearer in terms of there's been no official word on who is actually going to sit on that committee and how that's going to work. In terms of the TCA, the Joint Partnership Council has met, um, but it's, it only has met to uh, approve, the approve the extension of the ratification period for the European Parliament. So again, we don't know how the specialised committees and the various working groups underneath that Joint Partnership Council are going to work, um, and no idea of who's going to be uh, in the various delegations on those. Um, the same applies in respect of the civil society forums or the partnership, um, parliamentary partnership assembly. We don't know yet. 
Did we ever get a formal MOU or terms of reference for the Joint Partnership Council, or is that that was one of the things they were going to agree on, wasn't it? The Joint Partnership Council, um, its remit is really outlined in the uh, the TCA itself. There's a section on institutional provisions, and its work is outlined there. But like all these bodies, they have some flexibility in, in agreeing their own rules of procedure. So. Um, it may well be something that evolves over time, but there's been, um, other than what is provided in the TCA in terms of how it works, there's been not much other detail released. Okay, thanks. Jim? Yeah, I want to ask you a bit more about this joint consultative working group. Yep. We know when we look at the protocol in the annexes, we see the hundreds of EU laws which mm -hmm. apply directly to Northern Ireland. And it's through this joint consultative working group that there would be any flagging up of changes to those or new laws which would apply directly, laws that we don't make and can't change. What is the mechanism for even notifying mere legislators in Northern Ireland about what laws are to be handed down to govern the people that we're supposed to represent? Um, well, as I say, the JCWG, or Joint Consultative Working Group, hasn't had any of meetings other than its initial meeting to agree its rules of procedure. But um, from my reading of it is that um, the uh, EU will alert the UK to uh, these potential additions that, or amendments that will be made to the annexes as, that you refer to, but ultimately the decision will lie with the Joint Committee. Um, then there would have to obviously be in terms of a legislative scrutiny aspect, um, explanatory memoranda laid in Parliament to um, outline the government's position in relation to these proposals, um, and that would undergo its normal, um, it would undergo scrutiny in Parliament the same way as any other EU proposal did prior to um, exiting the EU. Um, I know that this is something that the House of Commons and House of Lords have been speaking to uh, Michael Gove around in terms of um, the documentary flow of information and how parliamentary scrutiny of these protocol matters and any changes to the protocol will be done in the future. Um, there's still some clarity that's needed on that and I, I know, for example, the House of Lords has uh, written to some of the Assembly Committees, I think yourselves included, um, in relation to that parliamentary scrutiny piece um, and that what it will really rely on is uh, an agreement from UK government to lay explanatory memorandum on these proposals to allow that scrutiny to take place. But let's be very clear, there is and will be no role for the UK Parliament, never mind the Northern Ireland Assembly, to change or amend any of those EU proposals, isn't that correct? Well, the government, uh, it remains to be seen what, how the government will take forward the documentary scrutiny process. No, no, with respect, uh, it doesn't remain to be seen. The protocol is very clear. There is no mechanism for any EU law which is applied through the protocol to be altered or changed by Parliament or Northern Ireland Assembly. That's abundantly clear, is it not? Sorry, what I was referring to was um, the documentary process that triggers parliamentary scrutiny in Westminster. Um, yes, but uh, the, the scrutiny is a mere explanatory. It's not a scrutiny which can lead to any change. These are laws handed down from Brussels that we don't make and can't change. Uh, That's the evil genius of the protocol, is it not? Well, it's for the Joint Committee to decide whether uh, any proposals to amend or add items to the protocol are agreed, so that's a political decision to I'm be taken. I'm sorry, you're joint... talking about a totally different thing from what I'm talking about. I'm, oh, ta sorry. I'm talking about the EU directives and regulations already cited in the annexes to the protocol, which mm -hmm. may subsequently be amended but amended only by Brussels, or new laws uh, falling within the ambit of the protocol decided and made only by Brussels. They will be handed down and put upon the people of Northern Ireland with no legislative authority or change or a capacity to amend them. Isn't that correct? Uh, sorry, Jim, I think it's, uh, John is here from Rays to... Yes, I know, but I want to, I want to be clear about this. Yeah, that's, that's fine, but... Am I wrong about that? 
the, the, uh, what I would just point out is the function of the Joint Committee is very much, it, it has a quite a limited um, function and can amend the withdrawal agreement, including the protocol, but only where amendments are necessary to, be to correct errors, address omissions or other deficiencies, but or it, to address unforeseen when the withdrawal agreement was signed. So it can't, so change, any, it can't change any upcoming EU laws which will be applied through the protocol. Isn't that right? So, well, sorry, I think, I think, I think, Jim, that's uh, where we. Well, well I, I don't understand why any researcher would have difficulty in telling me whether I'm right or wrong about that. I think, the, I think, the, I think you've answered your own question because it's it's self-evident that they they can't do that. The situation yes. is. Well, what's the difficulty in confirming that? Sort of, uh, sort of, Sean, I, I know you're quite uncomfortable in sort of being put in the position to ask that question as well, um, and uh, I think uh, I'm more than, more than content for, with your answer so far. Well, can, can I ask this? Is it correct that such discussion as there will be through the Joint Consultative Working Group will not, is not even subject to the publication of minutes? Yes, that's correct. It is. It's up. They would up to the co-chairs can decide to publish what they wish, but the meetings will take a, take okay. place in private. So contradictory if I'm wrong, but therefore we're not only in a situation where laws are made by for, in a foreign jurisdiction, which we cannot change or uh, approve or disapprove. Well, we don't even know. But about. the process, such as it is, is one in secret of which there are no minutes. Yeah, the meetings are confidential unless decided otherwise by the co-chairs, and the co-chairs can decide if they want to publish agendas or minutes, but it's entirely within their gift to decide that. There's one other thing puzzles me greatly, and maybe you could shed some light for me. Where, how does one reconcile the protocol with Section 46 of the UK Internal Market Bill, uh, Act? Where does the reconciliation lie between those two? No. no. Shona, if you if you don't have the information to your hand, we can we can seek a, a further briefing from that, and we'll talk to the legal people here to t look at that. I'm, I, I don't have to have it today, but I would like an explanation from someone like Shona as to what the reconciliation is between Section Forty Six and the protocol. Section 46, being, of course, being the one which creates a statutory obligation to facilitate the free flow of goods uh, from GB to Northern Ireland, and the protocol being something that does the very opposite. And I'm trying to see how are those two reconcilable and which has a supremacy. You understand the point I'm pursuing? Yeah, is it? Okay. Yep. I do indeed, but uh, I would I'd probably say you need to seek um, advice, perhaps from legal services, could give you a more fulsome answer than I could give you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, I had one final question, but maybe you don't know the answer. What percentage of our laws, particularly affecting our economy, are now made by Brussels, not by Belfast or London? I, I wouldn't have those figures to hand, I'm afraid. Are there such figures? Um, I understand that the executive officer are looking at the uh, 300 odd pieces of legislation that are in the annex to look in respects of which are devolved and which are not, and obviously where the power lies in terms of that decision. It's maybe something you could pursue with the executive. Okay, thank you. I think, sir, is there a proposal there, Jim, that we write to the uh, the executive office to ask them if they've scoped that uh, that area out yet? Well, the number of degree of laws that I are think likely the first to be affected. proposal would be that we seek advice from legal services as to what the reconciliation is between section 46 and the protocol yeah, the committee had already agreed to take a briefing from assembly research after easter about the internal markets act and the inter the interlocking okay. with the, the northern Ireland protocol so it would be assembly research um, but i will um, give them a heads up I think section you've got 46 the point. of particular yeah. interest yeah. Okay. Thanks. But I think it's also useful if the TEO are doing research yeah. on the number of laws. I think it's important that we, we have that information yep. from the TEO. Okay. Pat. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much, Donna. Um, I, I heard someone ask, and a lot of these intergov 
government and EU relations uh, haven't met. But I was just wondering about the executive committee in dealing with EU exit matters. And I just mm -hmm. was reading through last night their terms of reference. Have they met? Um, as far as I know, yes, they, they continue to meet, um, uh, but uh, there's no set timetable. It is decided by the executive uh, committee when they want to have single agenda item meetings. Um, and obviously, that it's depends just, on what is happening. It says in the terms of, re the terms of reference there, it was every two weeks, and I suppose that's what it was, at, you know, maybe just ask for. But, um, Sorry, Pat, just, just as apologies, and again, sir, I should have made a declaration of interest. One of the things I do as the party leader, I am the alternate for the well, executive the committee on the us. rest of it. So they have sat on occasion right. on the two-week level, but they're also subsumed into executive business as well. So that process has been ongoing. I won't make any comment because obviously it's covered by executive privilege about particular what is being discussed or the efficacy of those particular meetings. Well. I should make well, a declaration, Chair, if I may, then, because I'm the named person for my party. So if, the, if this. Well, I was just wondering. Well, that's great to know that, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Matt, chance, that. Chance, is there any chance of that setting? Oh, don't make me that, laugh, Mr. Baxter. Is there any chance that we might be informed in there over in that house? But nobody's nominated you know me for anything. Uh, this is like playing hide and seek. I'm happy to say I don't serve in any of those. <laughs> Sorry, don't make me laugh. Do not make me laugh. It's too sore. It's oh. too sore. Okay. That's, but it doesn't matter for the executive office, not for anyone here. Right. Okay. I feel a song coming on. Like you step in and I step out. Uh, no, have you any other questions, Pat? No, thanks. Okay. Shauna, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. And uh, I have a note in front of me here from the correspondence from the House of Lords EU Affairs Committee. But you can read that all on sort of page, I think it's page 147. I'll give you some sort of details on that particular issue as well. Okay, Shauna, thanks very much indeed. Cheers. Thank you. Have a good Easter. Okay. Move on to next item on the agenda: oral briefing, raised paper cladding, building regulations, the Republic of Ireland. For Dan, Dan, are you out there? Yes, indeed, I am. Good afternoon, Chair. Hi, Dan. Uh, the raised briefing paper approaches taken to combustible cladding materials in Ireland, page one hundred and seventy-four. And a previous related raised briefing papers on page 179. Uh, just, uh, Dan, would you like to sort of give us a brief outline? Certainly, yes. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Um, so, this briefing paper, as the Chair has just summarised, it follows on from a previous paper, which members will recall summarised approaches taken to the banning of combustible materials in cladding in England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Now this paper outlines this current briefing paper outlines the approach taken to combustible cladding materials in the Republic of Ireland. So just to recap, by way of background, the materials which featured in the Grenfell Tower fire consisted of an external cladding system with aluminium composite material or ACM rain screen panels containing a polyethylene core. And polyethylene, uh, as the inquiry has found, is a highly combustible substance. The material from which most of the Insulation boards were made, polyisocyanurate foam is also combustible. So by way of summarising the briefing paper in front of you, uh, combustible cladding materials have not been explicitly banned in Ireland. The Government of Ireland's response to the Grenfell Tower tragedy has focused instead on a wider review of building safety in the form of a fire safety task force. A review of the technical guidance relating to cladding, uh, we understand, is forthcoming. So I'll just spend the next few minutes describing the remit and results of the Fire Safety Task Force before then describing what the technical guidance currently says in regard to external cladding materials. Now, the Fire Safety Task Force was set up in Ireland on the 27th of June uh, 2017, very soon after the Grenfell Tower fire. And its remit was to examine uh, all high-rise buildings defined as more than six storeys or 18 metres in height and multi-storey and multi-unit social housing. And a survey was undertaken to establish if the circumstances which led to the Grenfell Tower fire were present in these forms of building in Ireland. Specifically, they were asked to identify those buildings which had external cladding, which might be cause for concern. Now, the task force uh, also requested local authorities to assess fire safety measures in their existing multi-storey, multi-unit social housing, i.e. whether that housing was high-rise or not. Now, the task force published it 
its report in May 2018, and a number of findings and recommendations were made. Its main finding was that, and I quote, the combination of contributory factors which appear to have existed in Grenfell Tower do not appear to be present in medium to high rise buildings in Ireland. The task force report included the following recommendations. This is just a very brief summary. Of the 842 medium to high rise buildings reviewed, it was recommended that a further assessment process and improvement works be conducted on 226 of these. Now the task force stated that national oversight should be maintained over remedial works on these 226 buildings and that an oversight report should be provided to the Minister for Housing, Planning and Local Government. Management companies and what are described in legislation as persons having control should review their fire safety facilities and evacuation procedures and fire services should offer training to directors of apartment management companies on key life safety issues. The task force also focused on the statutory responsibilities of the person having control of both public and private sector premises, and a number of amendments were proposed to the current regulatory system to enhance fire safety in certain types of residential accommodation. It was recommended that there should be better targeting and use of resources by local fire authorities in their engineer, educate and enforcement roles, and periodic reviews and overview reports of fire safety in local authority social housing should be undertaken and reported every five years. Now, just to be clear, the task force made no recommendations regarding the banning of combustible cladding, nor indeed the design of building materials of any kind. The existing guidance on external cladding materials is still technical guidance document B, fire safety, which was first published in 2006. And this states that where a building is more than 18 metres in height, the external surface must comprise material that meets the classification European Class B, S3, D2. And Class B materials, members may recall from the previous research paper, must make no more than a very limited contribution to a fire. However, this guidance is not the same as the Class A adopted in England and Wales, where cladding must make no contribution to a fire. Mm -hmm. Terms S3 and D2 relate to smoke and dripping, respectively. So S3 means that high smoke levels are permissible. D2 means that high dripping of heated material is also permissible. So no limit is set effectively for smoke production or for flaming droplets in the current guidance. And this is exactly the same as technical booklet E in Northern Ireland. So currently the situation north and south of the border regarding uh, um, guidance around uh, cladding material is exactly the same. Now, back to the Republic of Ireland for a moment. The, uh, a note is provided stating that an alternative route to conforming to the fire safety guidance would be to use a different test method. So this means that BR135 and BS8414 can be used, but that an alternative desktop assessment uh, may also be used. And the guidance states that, and I quote, in cases where no fire-specific test data exists for a particular cladding system, assessment may be made using a desktop study report from a competent person, stating whether, in their opinion, the BR135 criteria would be met, would be met with the system under assessment, end of quote. So by way of comparison, this alternative route is still permitted in Scotland, but following the Hackett review is no longer permitted in England. Now, the technical guidance in Ireland was reviewed and updated in February 20. But updates didn't make any changes to guidance regarding cladding, covering instead issues like common alarm systems, refuge spaces, new provisions for open plan flats, corridor travel distances, domestic sprinkler systems, and so on. However, the February 2020 update did state that a full and comprehensive review of technical guidance document B, fire safety, is being conducted currently by the Department of Housing, Local Government, and Heritage. Uh, and this will consider the recommendations of the Hackett Review in England, as well as common and emerging building trends, developments and events from a global perspective, matters relating to external fire spread, external fire resistance, internal fire resistance, cladding systems, sprinklers, etc. Now, it's understood that the Department of Housing established a consultative committee in December 2020 to discuss this revision prior to public consultation, we understand 
later in 2021. Thank you, Chair. That concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions on the paper if members have any. Okay, thanks. Jim? Um, I mean, this is a wee bit as a tangent to what you're doing, but do we have any idea of the importance of this industry in the Irish Republic in terms of its, manif its employment uh, and Thanks, contribution to the GDP. Uh, it's, this is leading to another question, by the way, yeah. in case you're wondering why I'm asking it. Yeah, I, I'm afraid I don't have any figures on that in front of me. Apologies. I, well, the next question is, is there any evidence that the relatively low-key approach by the Irish Republic may have been brought about by lobbying by the industry? Because it is interesting that, that, that their level of ch change is very, very minimal compared to England. Yes, I, I don't know, I'm afraid. Um, but to be clear, the, the, the technical guidance in Ireland is, has remained the same essentially since 2006 yes. and was the same in England and Wales and very largely the same in Scotland until 2018. Um, so the, 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 the guidance was quite similar. It just hasn't been changed either here or in the Republic of Ireland. But as to why it hasn't been changed yet and why that... Um, uh, that review of the guidance hasn't made quicker progress in response to the Grenfell Tower inquiry. I don't know, I'm afraid. I just, Sorry, just, just a quick one, just to come in there. Dan, in your research, did you pick up at anything, because I know there's been quite a few uh, major housing developments, particularly apartment developments in sort of uh, around Dublin, where there's been major concerns about fire safety, and indeed they've actually had to evacuate the, the, the residents of those areas as well. Has that not triggered some issues and concerns about sort of fire safety and fire regulations at all? It, it, yes, it has. Uh, and the, um, I think there have been some comments by academics looking at this issue to the relevant committee in the, in the Oireachtas, which I've cited in the paper there. Um, there, there. There has been a degree of discussion around that, certainly. Yes, it has. Um, yeah. Sorry, Jim. Sorry it's my understanding that this industry employs large numbers of people, particularly in border counties, uh, and it just would be interesting to see what lobby, if any, was instigated by that industry, um, to, to, which may have had an influence on, on the Irish Republic's apparent lack of activity. The other issue, of course, is that these products move back and forth across the border in, in huge numbers. And is there any danger that if uh, the Irish uh, have weaker regulations that some of that could end up being used up here, no matter what we do. Uh, that's probably one for the, our own Department of Finance, uh, I suppose, who are in charge of our own building regulations to, to address. Right. So you I'm afraid I, I, I wouldn't be able to comment on that specifically. You, you didn't pick up any lobby uh, when the Irish were doing the review to, to keep things as they are? Not, not that I've seen. Not that I've seen, I'm afraid, no. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see what happens with the review of uh, technical guidance document B, uh, which, as we understand, is, is ongoing at the moment. OK, thank you. OK, any other questions? OK, Dan, thanks very much indeed. Thanks very much indeed for your work and have a safe Easter. Thank you. Um, thank you. Team, I just want to draw your attention to a piece of correspondence on page 190. And it's correspondence following the Finance Committee meeting on the 3rd of March. And it was about sort of the fire safety and building control NI. And within the, the document, um, we were talking about, obviously, because it's of vital importance, building safety programme. And the department doesn't say what is proposed, but it might possibly include a fire safety bill, a new building safety regulation, etc. You will remember sort of previous correspondence when they wrote back to us and said this was going to be dealt with urgently, and this was an urgent matter. But it seems to imply in the sort of the correspondence there on page 119 that it will be now for the department. They are advising us now that it's up to the executive to determine whether a new development le levy will be implied to order the cost of fire safety improvements, and that about whether we're improving sort of building regulations during this mandate. And it implies that the head of the civil service is going to make the determination of which, uh, which uh, department is going to be the lead on this. Now, I was under the opinion that the Department of Finance would be the lead on this for, uh, uh, for fire safety regulations. 
and particularly when we also had the discussions about uh, energy efficiency certificates, I think, this week in the Assembly. I think I would probably quite like, uh, as a committee, for us to get clarity to see who is going to be the lead department on this issue. Because, I mean, when the Minister writes to us and said he's going to look urgently at fire safety regulations, I would take that that the Minister was taking that under his own cognizance and that would become a partner of the Department of Finance. But I think we need to find out, and to use the Minister's own words urgently, who is going to take responsibility for this issue, because I think that's important. Are we agreed to that? Mm -hmm. Agreed. Thank you. And if we next move on to a series of SL1s, uh, we have Alan Bronte and Ian Snowden are available if we need them, but I think I'll go through them unless we, we actually need to sort of pull them in. Uh, the first one is a written briefing on the SL1, the rates exemption for automatic telling machines in rural areas, regulations in Northern Ireland 2021. I say the department statutory rule is at page 200. The proposed rule will continue the rates exemption for separate entries in the valuation list associated with around 100 ATMs in designated rural areas. The list of designated areas is provided in the copy of Statutory Rule 2020 which is appended for information. The rule is subject to affirmative resolution assembly procedure. Well, Mr Chairman, um, the recent wave of closures of bank branches in rural areas has left many communities without any form of banking apart from ATMs. And therefore, I strongly welcome this decision to continue the rate relief. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? And right, I just add uh, my welcome to that as well, too, Chair. I haven't spoken uh, on the same issue previously in the Chamber. Uh, it's very welcome. Okay. And therefore, if the Committee is content that it's no objection to the related policy, and that is also content for the Department to make this rule, are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, moving to written brief in SL1, the rate small business hereditament relief amendment regulations in Northern Ireland 2021. The Department advises that this proposed rule is at page 213, was provided to the Committee prematurely and in error. Is the Committee content to therefore defer consideration of this proposed rule? Are we agreed? Agreed. Written briefing SL1, the financial assistance coronavirus soft play businesses regulation in Northern Ireland 2021. The Department's proposed statutory rules at page 224. The proposed rule will cover the provision of financial assistance to soft play businesses restricted between the 4th of July and 14th of December 2020. And therefore, the localised restriction support scheme came into place on October 2020. The rule is subject to negative resolution assembly procedures. Is the Committee content that it has no objection to the related policy and that it is content for the Department to make this rule? Are those in favour say aye? Chairman, Mr Chairman, once again, could I just come in here? Um, I have been extremely impressed with how this has been implemented. Um, all of us as MLAs have sent huge numbers of issues to the team, and I'm glad to say, as from yesterday, all of mine have been resolved effectively. We even got emails on a Sunday afternoon from the staff to confirm that people had got their payments. And I think it's, we always complain about the performance of the department officials, but when they get it right, it's important to recognise that. <coughs> I think we all echo that, and if we note that and said no doubt in the minutes. Okay, great. Great. Move on to written briefing SL1 Financial Assistance Airports Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. The Department's proposed statutory rule is at page 224, and the Department's response via state aid is at page 227. The proposed rule will increase support to the two airports from 7.8 million to the maximum of 10 million, and is designed to cover 100% of the airport losses up to the 2 million cap. The money was allocated during January monitoring, and the department previously advised of, the, advised, advised of this. The proposed rule will be subject to negative resolution procedure. A ministerial di directive was required for the previous related rule. Are we content that we have no objection to the? Sorry. He's agreeing. Oh, he's agreeing. Oh, that's good. If the committee is content. Just a bit, it's just a bit more than we give the golf clubs, apparently. <laughs> Would you like to speak up so that we can get that on the record, Jim? <laughs> uh, the Department of Finance didn't get in the golf clubs the money. Uh, is the committee content that there is no objection to the related policy and that is also content for the Department to make the rule? Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, SL1 next, the SL1 Rates Coronavirus Emergency Relief Regulations in Northern Ireland 2021. The proposed rule is at page 233, will come into effect on the 1st of April and will allow businesses in the following sectors hospitality, leisure, entertainment, tourism, 
airports, childcare, retail, manufacturing and newspaper production to enjoy 100 per cent rates relief for 2022. A related Ulster University Economic Policy Centre publication is page 240. The rule is subject to negative resolution assembly procedure. Matthew, do you want to say something? I agree. Uh, well, again, extremely good news. Okay, thank you. And if we are content, are we agreed? Absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, the SL1's Financial Assistance Coronavirus Supplementary Support Schemes Regulations in Ireland 2021. The proposed rule is at page 293 will permit one off coronavirus support payments to businesses of 50k or 25k or 10k, depending on their NAV. The, role, the rule is subject to negative resolution and required a ministerial direction. Is the committee content that there is no objection to the rate of policy and is also content for the department to make this rule? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. And if we can say to Ian and Ian and Alan, they're no longer required. Thank you very much. Okay, Ian and Alan, thanks for uh, being available. Okay, if we move on to the next written briefing, statutory 2021 56, the Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2021. The statutory rule 2021 56, the Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2021, is at page 305. The Department has made a statutory rule under the Public Service Pensions Act, Northern Ireland 2014. The rule will incre increase career average reva revalued earnings public service pension schemes from April 2021 by 0.5% in line with the Consumer Price Index, plus an additional revaluation percentage determined by the individual pension schemes. HM Treasury is to make a similar order to provide for equivalent pension schemes in GB. The rule is subject to negative resolution. The committee agreed on the 10th of February 2021 that it was content for the proposed rule to be made. The department advises that the policy content of the rule is unchanged from the SL1. The examiner of statutory rules has reported on the rule and has found nothing to draw attention to the committee. Jim, you want to say anything? Or? No, it's not. This isn't related to the issue we discussed last week. Um, this is uh, okay. It's, it's final salary schemes, but it's just the annual upgrading. Just worth saying, it's CPI rather than RPI, mm -hmm. which makes it a lot less lucrative. But that was a decision taken six years to go to change it. And we can't do anything about that. Okay. Anybody else to make any comment? Okay. If the members are content, uh, therefore, that the committee for finance has considered the statutory rule, statutory rule 2021-56. The Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order Northern Ireland 2021, and has no objection to this rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay. Uh, now I move on to correspondence. Uh, we have quite a bit of this. Uh, Sir, I have a look at the correspondence index. Ask to note the cor index of correspondence at page 315. First item is the Department of Finance allocations to the Department of e Education. Members are asked to note the Department's response on page 319, indicating that an allocation to the Department of Education for a pay deal that has not been concluded was an accrual and thus within HM Treasury rules. Okay, members content to note? Okay, agreed. Department of Finance PFG priority areas. Members are asked to note a response at page 321, indicating that its input to economic policy is limited to strategic finance and local taxation, and its input to digital infrastructure is for the Northern Ireland civil service only. Are we content to note? Agreed. Uh, Department of Finance Treasury Banking and Financial Provider. Uh, Pat, we have an apology to you to make. Uh, it does. Uh, actually, the, um, the Department for Finance does have responsibility. Uh, I, think, uh, we, I think we have been both pushing that, so we <laughs> claim that as an SDLP victory. <laughs> <laughs> press release, send. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I must admit, I'd sort of, when we looked at it and we did and the rest of it, and thank you very much indeed sort of, um, <laughs> for the hard work and sort of devilling behind that. But I just want note, members to note that uh, further to response to page 324 from the department indicating that it has the lead role with HM Treasury and banking matters, and that it engages locally on those COVID loan schemes, EU exit, and general access to finance matters. Well done. Well, members, are we content to share this response with the Committee for the Economy? Because I think it was news to them as well. For its information, and has previously agreed to undertake informal engagement with local banking representatives regarding loss of banking services. I think Chair would have to take a note. <coughs> they prefer to share it with us. 
Yeah. Yes. No, I agree. Yeah. 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 I going to say the same thing. The Good. Same thing. So, so the answer probably will be I think we'll make a wee decision on it collectively. <laughs> <laughs> Are we agreed? No, I'm serious. No. <laughs> <laughs> Would you care to put a proposal? I think that uh, since we found out that it belongs to this committee, I think it should be our role, and I believe we should take up the mantle of it. And we don't need to abdicate where we are with it, but you're not happy with that, Peter. Uh, no, there is there's in, the the chair, the chair. Uh, in, in standing orders um, where there is a dispute between committees about where our responsibility lies. We try and work it out among ourselves. You can do it concurrently. You could even set up an ad hoc committee, or you can refer the matter to the business committee and they can decide. Yeah, well, I, think, it, so. I, think I, th I think because my relationship with the chair of the economy committee is very good, I shall liaise with the chair of the, the economy do. committee sure. to do that. And just when you are liaising with them, remember, and I think the sort of black ball does on. <laughs> Uh, moving on to Department of Finance monitoring rounds, members are asked to note a response at page 326 to the Infrastructure Committee clarifying the Department Minister's oral statement and monitoring rounds. Are members content to note? Content. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, did you make it? Oh, right. Okay. Just, uh, uh, Department of Finance financial allocation associated with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Members are asked to note a response at page 329 to the Committee regarding 400 million of financial allocations associated mm -hmm. with. New Deal for Northern Ireland NI Protocol. This money is retained by the United Kingdom Government and will be allocated as it, con as it considers appropriate. The Committee has already written to the NIO on this matter. Are we content to note? Content. Content. Chairperson, just for members' information, the NIO has just responded in the last hour or so. so oh, has it? circulated that to members um, by email. Uh, they've indicated that um, about half of the money has been allocated, but it is pretty much as in line with the department's uh, response that it's, uh, there is no bidding process. It is for uh, uh, the uh, NIO to determine, the Secretary of State to determine how it is allocated. Okay. You've clearly looked after. Okay, moving to the Department for Finance Spring Supplementary Estimates. The members are asked to consider the response at page 331 of the Committee regarding the Spring Supplementary Estimates. The Department clarifies that the Legal Services Agency provision of £40 million represents total legal aid liability. I think that was the question you were asking, Jim, which is unlikely to be realised during 2021-22. The Department has provided an update on allocations made versus headroom. The total of the allocation figures in the table does not seem to match up to the £668 million allocation in the covering letter. Mm -hmm. Are the members content to write again to the Department seeking clarity on headroom and allocations? I think there is a substantial agreed. delta on this. We are agreed. agreed. Um, next item in Department of Finance, year-end capital surges. Members are asked to consider the response at page 337 to the Committee regarding year-end capital surges. The Department indicates, indicates that capital underspend is below the carryover threshold, thus late surges are not problematical. Are members content to write to statutory committee and ask them to seek clarity on year-end capital surges, which seems to be a, uh, it's now seems to be becoming a bit of a historical uh, fact as they're coming through? I think it's important that we do this. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Department of Finance correspondence uh, items uh, 1609 to 1610. Our members can note, content to note Department of Correspondence on the Sports Sustainability Fund, Construction Employers Federation briefing. Are we content to note and say are we and the constru uh, sorry the Construction Employers Federation briefing at page 339 and 340. Are we content to note? Content. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Next one: Public Sector Pay Policy 21-22. Are members content to note Department of Correspondence at page 344 and Correspondence at page 348 from NICS employees? Are we content to note? Noted. Noted. Yeah. Uh, Chairpersons Liaisons Group, Committee Consideration of Legislation. Uh, members are asked to note Correspondence on page 350 regarding concerns raised by the Committee for Justice in relation to a condensed committee stage for the Damages Return on Investment Bill. Members are reminded that the Committee for Finance will be obliged to consider four or more committee stages of the bill, possibly simultaneous in the autumn. This will probably require additional or longer meetings at this time. Paul, do you want to say something as a member of the Justice Committee? Or you can... No, I'll just leave it. 
Either that or in the meantime. Okay. Are members are we content to note? No. no. Okay. Uh, Chairpersons Liaisons Group Questionnaire Strengthening Scrutiny. Members are asked to complete a questionnaire for members at page 354 regarding legislative scrutiny. Are we can content to note and to fill in the questionnaire? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Content. Good. Uh, Welsh Parliament Finance Committee Timing of UK Budget. Members are asked to note a copy of correspondence at page 360 to the Convener of the Finance and Constitution Committee of the Scottish Parliament regarding the need for reform of Westminster budget processes for devolved administrations. Are we content to note? If I may, I'm just going to suggest if, if there's a, any uh, devolved, um, collective devolved interest in, um, uh, first of all, us writing to, um, or either writing on our behalf to the other committees and asking about their practice in terms of getting briefing from uh, HM Treasury, given we've had the, the now, what I think can only be, just, I think what can only be, as if uh, I say, this is a former Treasury employee who still has many friends who work in that organisation, can only be described as officially a discourtesy uh, from that organisation. Um, uh, but it would be, I think, I just wonder if there's a, if we can write to them in terms of seeking, or, you know, finding out what their practice is in terms of uh, engagement with HM Treasury. I think, Chair, the correspondence actually indicates that the HM Treasury didn't respond to the Welsh uh, Committee. I think I'm right in saying also okay. those committees are about to disappear into Perda very shortly. Of course, so, yeah. Well, the Welsh one as well? Is there an... Yeah, yeah well, they're all until election time. Please forget about Wales. <laughs> Don't be careful what you wish for. So, that being the case, we're going to take a note. Yeah, it happens to note. Okay. Uh, where are we next? Uh, sort of uh, Special European Programme Body Annual Report and Accounts 2019. Members are asked to note the response at page 362 to the committee regarding the simplified cost options and interreg VA payments. Are we content to note? Okay. Uh, Department for Finance launch a public consultation on proposals for the Peace Plus programme. Members are asked to consider information at page 366 and at page 59 of table items regarding the launch of a public consultation on proposals for the Peace Plus programme. Are members content to receive a briefing from officials and SEUBP once a consultation is concluded at the end of May? I think that will probably be the best time to get it. Yeah. Great. Uh, correspondence item number 18, Rockpool Limited uh, Building Regulations. Members are asked to consider at page 377 a request to meet the committee to discuss the campaign for stronger fire regulations across the UK. Are we just content to receive a Britain briefing from Rockpool Limited? I think we, we should be one of the certain COVID restrictions. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, Department of Finance Building Regulations. Members are asked to consider further correspondence at page 378 from the Department regarding what appears to be a wider review of building and energy standards and which will ensure consistency with the European Performance of Buildings Directive. Members, are we content to receive an oral briefing from this on the Department? Yeah. Great. Uh, Fiscal Council, uh, members, member of the public, Fiscal Council for Northern Ireland. Members are asked to note correspondence on page 409 from a member of the public regarding the Fiscal Council and section 75 screening within the Northern Ireland University sector. The matter raised in the correspondence are likely to be outside the remit of the Fiscal Council. This correspondence is also received by the Department and the Public Accounts Committee. Members, are we content to note? Note. Agreed. Uh, I think for item 16.21, uh, sorry, I should have declared a declaration on this one. Uh, this is a, a constituent of mine. Paul, have you got that in front of you? 16.21, if you could cover that. 16.21. Yeah, okay. Page 413. Got it, yep. You happy enough then to yeah. sit on or you are? Okay, yeah, members. Uh, I, shall, I shall withdraw myself for that. Okay, members, can I uh, ask to consider further correspondence at page 413? That correct, and at page 151 of table items from a member of the public regarding issues around the Northern Ireland Civil Service, can I ask our members content to write again to the individual restating the committee's position as agreed previously? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Okay, and um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair, for covering that. Uh, 16, item 22, departmental correspondence, monthly monthly outturns. Members are asked to note correspondence on page 152 of tabled items which provide the monthly outturns for February 2021. Are we content to note and forward these to raise for analysis? Agreed. Uh, item 23, correspondence, re LRSS. 
Members are asked to note correspondence at page 182 of tabled items from a concerned business person in respect of delayed LRSS payments. The committee can't deal with individual cases, and uh, uh, I think we should be directed the correspondence to contact his local MLA if we are content on that issue. Chair, go ahead. He's a constituent. Sorry, I, I think I heard that. Yeah, you, say, yeah, you broke up there a second. Sorry, I my protection, so I have followed up. I think, Jemma, you're saying that you're going to follow up with them. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thanks, Gemma. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Are we content? Content. Yeah. Uh, composite request, uh, members, uh, to consider the composite request of page 417. Is the committee content with the composite request as an accurate and complete record of the committee's information requests? Are we agreed? Agreed. Yep. Agreed. Okay. If we move on to the forward work program, the draft forward work program is on page 429. Uh, the Department has clarified that the LCM and pensions reform is not expected immediately after Easter and may not be introduced to the Assembly until later in this session. Is the Committee therefore content to defer the briefing from Assembly research in this matter, which was scheduled for the 14th of April, until later in the session? Are members content with this approach? Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Are members content to take a briefing from the Department on its review of energy performance and building regulations on the 14th of April? Are we agreed? Agreed. Is the committee agreed. content to invite an oral briefing on international perspectives on public sector reform uh, from Dr. McCurris MacArthur at, at Queen's University on the 20th of April? Are we agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Is the committee content to invite uh, Ulster University Economic Policy Unit to brief on rates reform on the 2nd of June? Are we agreed? Agreed. <coughs> Okay. Can I just uh, go ahead? Go ahead I'm just going to check, Chair, but I don't, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead. On we have um, stakeholder options for the governance of. We've got fiscal council down. Options for the governance of fiscal council for oral briefing on the fifth of May, Thank and you. something on the fiscal council for twelfth of May. Are we hoping to keep those in as placeholders? Um, I've been go in ahead. contact. Sorry, beg your pardon, Chairperson. I've been in contact with um, a number of um, stakeholders, and we are, um, and I will bring a list of them the next time the committee meets. So uh, th there will be somebody. I think they've already. Uh, so it's people like uh, we're trying to get the OECD, yeah. um, Nevin Economic Research Institute, um, uh, Institute for Fiscal Studies, and uh, if we're also trying to get the current um, person in charge of OBR and the equivalent organisation of the Republic of Ireland, equivalent organisation of the Fiscal Council of Scotland, and to see if they will talk to us. So the idea being, Chairperson, sorry for, sorry for going on, the Fiscal Council and Fiscal Commission will write out to stakeholders very shortly. They will write to the committee yeah. and they will say, committee, what would you like the terms of reference for the Fiscal Council to be? My plan would be then to take evidence from these various people and then the committee could formulate its views yeah. right back and say this is what we want this is how it should be legislatively independent or what have yeah. you whatever members want i think that makes that, that makes sense this was my, my, my only comment was going to be to, i suppose to incur but you're already doing peter it, but just i think this is my perspective possibly the most important thing we will do before the end of the mandate as a committee and it's a real area where we can add value, and we need to be part of creating it and scrutinising. And um, and so, I just my hope is that we can just agree as a committee a program of work that is. I think we need to kind of bottle it, if you see what I mean. So it's it, it, it's not it, it's that we're working towards a, a proper package of scrutiny, and we understand we're all signed up to that rather than simply um, having some taking some oral oral evidence on it and then moving on. No, I think it's important, and particularly if we want to get this onto a legislative framework exactly, within by yeah. the end of the by the end of the uh, uh, the assembly. Okay, uh, moving on to AOB. Jim. Yeah, uh, chair. There was a alarming report in the Financial Times this morning relating to the uh, UK government's guaranteed recovery loan scheme which would give loans of up to £10 million with 80% guarantees to the banks. And it's to replace the COVID-related business interrupted loan scheme. And the alarming aspect is that the, the FT is running a line that because of 
the protocol, we would fall foul of state EU rules. state aid rules which prohibit assistance to any undertaking in difficulty. They have a test, the undertaking in difficulty test. And if that was applied to businesses in Northern Ireland, it could well prevent many of them being able to access the Guaranteed Recovery Loan Scheme. So the situation would be in GB, there would be greater liberty to help companies in distress than there would be here. And therefore, I think we should be writing to the department, uh, seeking to suss that out uh, and see is the FT report correct uh, and where that leaves us. Have you got access to the FT article? Have you got it online? I have it online, I think, yeah. Could you, you send it to us? Chair, could, could I, uh, Mr. Alsis, I just authorise that to all members? Yeah, I'll send it to the clerk, and he can. Yeah, send it. It's going to send it to the clerk, and yeah. I'll push it out there. Be careful with sending FT articles because they're very particular about their subscriptions and tax being sent out of FT articles. That's right. <laughs> I can speak from experience there, but anyway, <laughs> we can all get locked up. <laughs> no, but sort of, I think, Jim, there was a question that had been raised about three weeks ago specifically to do with issues on COVID recovery and state aid yeah. and implications for Northern Ireland companies. But I don't think it had re has received any sort of clarification. It yeah. had been raised as a potential issue, but there was yeah. nothing that had been said that there was, there didn't seem to be an implication to it. Yeah. So is the, um, is the thrust of the FT article that they have picked up something from Treasury that is likely to create that? I'm not having read it. That's I'm sort of sort of a bit struggling here. Well, I think I think the suggestion is they picked up that the EU state aid rules prohibit assistance to uh, undertakings in difficulty, uh, and whereas the GB scheme obviously would be a large part exist for that it. purpose. Yeah. Uh, and therefore they're identifying that companies uh, in Northern Ireland or indeed companies in GB with significant presence in Northern Ireland could be prohibited on state aid rules. So I think, I think it could the become a big concern. The proposal would be to write to the the proposal would be to write to the department for clarification yeah. on issues of whether the uh the uh can I just ask, my, my suggestion, Chair, I'm not going to be difficult about it, but I think it might actually be quicker if I have the article in front of me because I've got the app, but it might be quicker right, to write to the Treasury directly. I know we haven't had great luck getting, I mean, I, I, well, we could do both, both, I suppose. Do both. Yeah. I mean, I think, it, I think the easiest thing is to do both. Yeah. And could we also info it to the uh, economy minister as well? Yeah. yeah. To the economy. Chair, I have one other much smaller issue, but an irritating issue for some. Uh, in the recent UK budget, there was a concession made for leisure boats that, <laughs> that they could now use red diesel. And again, that apparently here. is not going to apply here because of EU restrictions on red diesel. Yep. Can we get green? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jim. <Jill. laughs> um, and some of, obviously it's a very discreet issue, but it's agitating a number of people that they are being denied cheaper fuel, um, again, under the protocol arrangement. So I don't know if we could explore that with the department. I did raise a question to the minister, and he answered in a strange way by saying no one had raised it, so he'd raised no representation, even though my question raised it. There is also an issue to do with uh, designation of fuels and yeah. it's under kind of whatever EU regulation or whatever happens to be there's specific regulations of fuels and standards of fuels oh. and there is a designation that brings in what would be standard for UK fuels but that is not permitted under EU environmental legislation yeah. and there are indications that in Northern Ireland and I think uh, the uh, uh, the Honourable Member for um, East Antrim, Roy Beggs, had raised that as a, as a question as well. 
and I think that's also Im implicit as well in the question about sort of uh, diesel and marine diesel for sort of vessels, and it mm. also affects the fishing community as well. Mm. So I think if to use the wording of it, it might be useful because it uh, it deals with uh, will deal specifically with duty and duty regulations on fuel. Mm. So and that comes under uh, I think that does come under our remit. Yep. Yep. So I think it's it's worth uh, it's worth at least exploring with the DALO, and then we might follow that up with a, a detailed detailed question if we get some response on it. Thank you. Back to the department. Yeah. 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 Okay. If we can turn. Okay. Um, any other business? I have one item to bring up. Uh, FOI request during the Easter recess. It's normal practices for committees to delegate authority to the chairperson and the deputy chair during periods of recess to submit views on the releasing and holding of information on any non-routine contentious FOI requests received. The committee would be advised of any such requests. The views expressed by the chairperson or the deputy chairperson and the response issued by the FOI unit at the first available meeting following the recess period. Are we content with this process? Great. Mm -hmm. uh, 18.2, RHI disciplinary process. Are members content to go into closed session in order to consider tabled restricted correspondence from the Minister? Are we agreed? Agreed. 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 